You ready to learn the Bible tonight? Amen. 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 Then let's take that Bible and let's do something with it, shall we? Revelation chapter 20. Go ahead and get ready and get yourself set there and then we'll kind of move along a little bit. It's good to see everybody here. Everybody have a good day. Amen. Glad to see Laura here. Laura's feeling better. Amen. And Jenny Gelt's obviously feeling much better from something. I have no idea. A nap. <laughs> she just got tickled. Gwenny had a good birthday, didn't you? No comment? Oh, okay. Amen, she said. I like that girl. Amen. Well, I'm going to get weird on you tonight. You raised her. Lisa said, just tonight? <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heaven knows you need it. Amen. Uh, Sister Pam is over with Sister Bonnie tonight. Bonnie's going to get out Tuesday. So praise the Lord for that. And uh, so, amen. I, I, I know Roy was really worried there for a while, and he was pretty down. So uh, that, that kind of lifted him up, that uh, she was able to go in that place, and they're able to do with her what they're doing, and uh, getting her ready to, to be at home. So praise the Lord for that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to guide us and lead us tonight. Uh, you'll find that even if it sounds weird, if it's biblical, it's right. Amen? It's right. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for uh, the joy of being in your house once again, the joy of uh, being in the presence and the fellowship of people that, Lord, I know they love the Lord, they love your word, and uh, Father, they're just not going to get any satisfaction in life unless, Lord, they get it from your word. <clears throat> and I pray, dear God, that you would bless them with that tonight. Lord, I don't have anything good to say or to give uh, without giving them the word of God. And so, Father, I thank you, dear God, that you have equipped us with your word. Father, there's so many wonderful things in here, things to learn, things to, uh, to understand, things, Lord, that we can apply. Uh, even in our daily lives. The things, Father, that are going to happen in the future, Lord, they're just, uh, Lord, the big picture of some of the things, Lord, that we see every day. So, Father, bless your word tonight. Bless your people tonight, wherever they are. Watch over them, dear God, and, and prepare us for the day ahead of us, for the week ahead of us. Father, prepare us, dear God, for days that are coming. And, Lord, use us for your glory, your kingdom's sake, do that always from this church, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, <clears throat> Amen. Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 4, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark, upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I mentioned um, in Tim LaHaye's series on the, the novels that he wrote called the Left Behind series, I had mentioned in there that in one of the books called The Mark, that Tim LaHaye and, and Jerry, um, Jerry Jenkins, his co-author, co-writer, uh, that they had implanted in that series the idea that if people found themselves living in a time where the mark of the beast was given to people and say that some, somebody had received the mark, 
but then they regretted that they had it, that they would have a second chance to repent and say, I don't want this mark on me, I still want to go to heaven. Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins planted the idea that they, yes, they would still be available to go to heaven. They would still be eligible for salvation even though they had taken the mark. What you just read contradicts that. Let's read that again. Um, they were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads. There are people who decide they're not taking this mark, and they are persecuted for that. These are the ones who receive salvation. These are the ones that Jesus honors with living and reigning with him for a thousand years. But the Bible is very specific, and it says in no uncertain terms, if you receive that mark, you are going to hell. Period. No doubt about it. There is nothing in the Scripture. Tim Lahay, not only Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, but John MacArthur... John MacArthur was asked this question, and he left it open to, the, along the same idea that, well, you know, we know that some people uh, are going to make it through the tribulation, and they're going to be from all nations, so obviously there are some who take the mark that are still going to be okay during the millennial reign. I don't know where he gets that from. I don't know what verse justifies that if you're told by God in the Bible not to take that mark and if you do there is everlasting punishment for that in fact I, I just I wanted you to turn to Revelation 9 and let me set this up for you in Revelation 9 some beasts come up out of the bottomless pit, some very evil devils, and they sting everybody. And this sting that they receive causes them to not die. It gives them immortality. Let me set this up. There is a move right now. Google is in on it. Microsoft is in on it. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, who, is, who works for Google as one of their chief thinkers. And in medicine, biology, technology, there is a growing movement that says we can cure death. We can cure mortality. If we change DNA, if we through technology uh, alter the human body in certain ways so that man will not die, Ray Kurzweil made the prediction that by the year 2045, that would be about the time that man has the ability to become immortal. That was on Time Magazine. The front cover of Time Magazine, was, that was his prediction. Ray Kurzweil is moving and advancing technology and science and, and medicine to that end. Ray Kurzweil does not want to die. He desperately doesn't want to die. And I know why. He rejects God. And he doesn't want to die. I think there's something in him telling him the consequences that's awaiting him on the other side, whether he wants to admit it or not. The man doesn't want to die, and I know why he doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to go to hell. So there is a, a vast movement to bring mankind to a place where he will be immortal. So here in Revelation 9, um, verse 5, these beasts come out, these scorpions come out, and they sting people. And in verse 5, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. 
Uh, and their torment was as the torment of a, of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And watch this. Two different types of people in the world. Those of us who are seeking immortality through Jesus Christ. Once we achieve it, we never want to go back to live down here. Nobody in heaven says, Oh, I wish we could go back and live on earth. Okay? No one does. Here, they seek immortality. These devils come up, sting them, give that to them, and now they want to die. Why? Because the torment that they are experiencing is so bad, they all want to die, but for five months on this earth, no one dies. But they seek death and cannot find it. Okay? When it says they shall seek death, I think it could very well mean that they will attempt to kill themselves and not be able to. The Hulk. Right? Did you watch the Avengers? The Hulk said he tried to kill himself. He put a bullet in his mouth and the Hulk spit the bullet back out. So he knows he can't die. But he wants to. And people are going to want to die. And they're not going to be able to die. See, that's the devil right there. He sells you something with a promise. Boy, this is going to be great. And when you get it, you're going, I don't want this. And the devil's saying, too bad. You got it. This is what you wanted. And now you got it. Amen? Boy, aren't you glad you don't serve him anymore? Amen? Amen. So, now that I've given you that, let's go to, uh, go to the book of Judges, okay? Turn to the book of Judges. Let me get uh, my notes there. The book of Judges, if you think about it, the kind of government that Christ is going to set up on the earth is very similar to the government that was in place under Moses. You remember, and I taught you this, that the, the sort of the, the typology of Moses, he was not the king, Moses was not the supreme dictator, he was the chief judge. Alright? And Jethro came to him and said, it's not wise what you're doing, uh, you need to set up s smaller judges, rulers over thousands, Rulers over hundreds, rulers over fifties, and rulers over ten. All of those based upon the number thousand. Thousand was the top number. And then they had judges, you know, down below that. And they all assisted in judging the nation of Israel. So I think that is the government that Christ is going to establish during the thousand year reign. He is going to be king of kings and lord of lords. But he's coming back to judge the earth. And he is going to be the chief judge over the earth for a thousand years. The law that's going to be in place is the law of God that God gave to Moses. Those are, that's what's going to be in place. And so we who come back with him are going to rule over this earth by way of we're not going to establish law we're not going to write laws. We're not going to create new laws like Congress does. All we're going to do is say, well, this is what the law says and this is what you have to do. This is what judges are supposed to do anyway. Judges are not supposed to come up with new laws from the bench. And a lot of judges have undertaken that. They're not True American judges, in my opinion. True American judges would say, this is what the law says, and this is how it's going to be. Amen? That's how it should be. But we've got judges, we've got liberal judges on the bench that see the Constitution as a, I guess, a wad of gum, or a piece of clay, or Play-Doh, that can be bent and molded in whatever shape they want it to be in. And that's how they see it. But that's not how it is. 
So really, if you look in the book of Judges, you're going to see a lot of the typology of how the kingdom of God is going to be during that, during that reign. And in many places, you're going to see the war and the battle that was fought in order for the judge to be established and righteousness to reign in the land. If you, I, I've taught this many times, but if you study the book of Judges, you'll see that Israel goes in cycles. Okay, They'll, they'll have a judge. He'll, re, he'll pull them away from the, the evil dominance that's over them. He will be their savior. And then he will reign over the people and rule over the people as a judge. But then, because of that, righteousness is in the land. And God blesses them. And when God blesses us, what's the first thing we do? Get lazy on God. Don't need to pray. Everything's going well. Don't need to read my Bible. I feel good today. When, that's when the devil comes in and starts working on us. And all of a sudden now we're kind of turning ba our backs on God again. Not praying, not reading our Bible. And just don't care about those things. And the devil comes in, weakens us a little bit. But God is in that as well. Because every time things go well, we kind of get big in the head, don't we? Kind of get a little cocky and get full of pride. God says he can't use you, so he's going to bring us down a little bit. And that's what he does. And I don't mean to get into all that. I'm just I'm trying to tell you that you'll see in many places a type of Christ at the beginning of his reign, he has to put down the enemies of his kingdom. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's what he's doing here. If you look in Judges chapter 1, in fact, I, I told you to turn to Judges, right? Did you do it? Thank you, Miss Linda. I appreciate that. Judges chapter 1, Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. So here's a, here's a picture here of the thousand year reign and Christ putting down the enemies of his kingdom. There's going to be a one great big gigantic fight at the beginning of Christ's reign. It's going to be the battle of Armageddon. All right, And you can see many, many pictures of that battle and what it looks like all throughout your Bible. Judges chapter 3, verse 29. And they slew of Moab at that time 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. You can take that and you can apply that to the battle of Armageddon. Who is going to escape the battle of Armageddon? Not a man. Nobody is. Christ is coming down. He's, got the, he's going to fight them with the sword that comes out of his mouth. He's going to fight them with his word. And when Christ gives out His Word, it does exactly what it's supposed to. And all the, you know, just think about it. All, all Jesus has to say is, be God. And they're God. Boom. Just like that. Okay? So, I mean, that's, that's how quick and decisive this battle is going to be. What, listen, here's what I'm telling you. One of these days, all of the enemies that you have fought against are going to be destroyed. Folks, have some hope. Have some hope. Got a guy that calls our ministry, every, uh, I say every now and then, about every week. And for some reason, I just, I like him. And he is, um, I'd say he's probably in his, maybe in his 40s. He lives, he has been living alone. He's moving in with his mom. He is on disability. He has some, he has some psychological issues. He has, he suffers from severe depression. He suffers from... Uh, uh, I don't know, just different things and so on. And he really struggles with things. And he calls and he just wants to talk a little bit, ask me a question or two. And then he always wants me to pray for him. Pastor Hoggard, I really struggle with this. I really struggle with that. And I'll tell him, listen, I love you. I don't know, you know, I don't know what it is about this guy. I've never met him. But I just love the guy. He's, he's somebody that is very weak. Okay, And all he wants is for God to heal him and for God to um, get, make him strong. He wants the sins of his life gone and he realizes he has no power whatsoever to make them gone. And I tell him, listen to me, God said his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. You asked God to take him away, didn't you? Yeah. 
Has God taken them away yet? No. I said, don't think for a minute he's not going to. He said that he would. You have to trust him to know that he'll do it in his time and in his way. But when he does, it'll be a decisive battle. It'll be like this here. There's escape. Not a man. When Christ gets ready to do it in your life, it will be a decisive battle and it will be over with. And you'll never have to worry about this again. And he always thanks me. He always tells me he prays for me. And I like that. Okay? Now, I don't know. Like I say, I don't know what it is about this guy. I just, I have a very soft heart for him. And he called today. And he's wanting me to pray with him about some things. He said, I'm very weak. And he said, my mind just doesn't work too well sometimes. And he said, that gets me in trouble. And he said, sometimes I just don't know what to do. I said, then you just read your Bible and believe it. He said, I do. I believe every word in it. King James Bible. So I like that guy. Amen. But when Christ is ready to do battle in your life, I promise you it will be a decisive battle. There will be nothing escape what Jesus is going to do in your life. He'll do it full and complete, and that will be the end of it. There will be no more need to fight after that. So every now and then, Jesus is going to have a battle of Armageddon in your soul. It's going to be a decisive battle. It's going to be the end of it. God's going to deal with this issue in your life. And once He does, you're not going to have to worry about that ever again. There are things in your life already that God has done that with. Say amen. He hasn't done it with all of it, has He? He still has battles to fight. Let Him fight it. He's better than you are anyway. Amen? Alright, so. This is, he's, so the book of Judges now is telling us that every time this new judge comes on the scene, he's got a battle to fight. And every one of these battles, I think, are showing us the battle of Armageddon. So now, here's where, here's where Mike Hoggard gets a little weird. Or has been a little weird. Okay? Because we're going to look at how Jesus, at the very last battle, is going to destroy all of the aliens. Dun, dun, dun. This is the opening of the X-Files. King James Version. Look in Judges chapter 4. In fact, turn your Bibles there. We're going to be in and around that area tonight. Judges chapter 4. Who in here believes in aliens? Look at you guys. You guys are weird. Okay? Now, let me, let me apply that term the way the Bible does. It has a couple of definitions. Number one, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perivites, the Amorites, those were alien. The, Phil, the uh, I almost said the Philippians. The Philistines. They were alien to the people of God. They, did, they were not of the nation of Israel. Therefore, they had no place being in the land of Israel. I mentioned this before in 1 Samuel 17. That's the chapter that deals with Goliath. The Philistines have invaded the land so far that now they have invaded and they're in the land of Judah. They're in Shoko, the Bible says, which belongeth to Judah. And I get a lot out of that. That means it doesn't belong to the Philistines. They should not be there. This land is your land. This land is my land. Right? And I'm just, you say I'm mean if you want to. If you want to come to this country, I am all for you coming to this country legally. But to just cross our borders and not be willing to participate in our laws and our language, you are an alien, you are an illegal alien, and you should not be here. You want to come back? Do it the right way. That's just common sense. That's not hate. That is common sense. Because in this country, we have our ways, our lifestyle, our religion, and our language. Okay? This is how we like it. 
If you don't like it this way, stay where you are. If you want it this way in your life, then come here and be an American. Every other nation in the world does that. You know how many Muslims live in Japan? Almost none. Japan has a very strict policy on allowing anybody from a Muslim nation into their country. Almost without fail, if you're a Muslim wanting to come into Japan, they don't let you. They might let you come and visit and holiday, vacation, but to come and stay, they don't do that. It has to be a very unusual circumstance in order to see Japan is that way. Then how come Japan doesn't get called haters and racists and everything else? How come we are simply because we think that's the right way? There are some people who just are not going to be compliant with American law, American justice, our Constitution, and our way of life. They should not be allowed to come here. Now let me apply it another way that the Bible does. There are spirits that are aliens. Now, if you believe in UFOs and aliens, here's your thing. I believe that these things that people are seeing in the sky, I have biblical reason to believe that those are biblical aliens, spirits, evil spirits. I have biblical... Re Let me show you. Let me show you. Turn to um, Ezekiel, chapter 1. Now, some of the stuff that people see is phony and fake and fraud. I get that. So does the Air Force. Some of that stuff is real. The Air Force agrees with me. The Air Force did their research on it. Project Blue Book, and they determined that there was a small percentage of UFO encounters that had no logical explanation. And the guy, the research physicist that they hired to do it, he was a fierce skeptic when he started out, and then he was a believer afterwards. Because he said, there's just too many things that people saw and too much evidence that I can't discount it. I know that they saw something unusual, ships in the sky that did things that we don't have ships that can do those things. So he believed it. Okay? So, from the Bible, here's what we find. In Ezekiel chapter 1, um, in verse 4, I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire... Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Now I'm going to skip over a lot of this, but I, then I want you to notice, um, look at verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. What is it that people say they see at night? Bright lights like lamps, multicolored. And it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of the flash of lightning. People are seeing these ships move in ways, in very fast ways that uh, pilots, Air Force pilots, uh, commercial pilots, see these things flying alongside their aircraft, and then boom, they're a thousand yards away and they have no explanation how they got there that quick. Here's your explanation right here. Now, what were these four angels, these four living creatures? Uh, look at verse 16, the appearance of the wheels. They had wheels. These four angels had wheels. Uh, uh, and their work was like into the color of a barrel and they four had one likeness and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon the four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, he's talking about the wheels, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. 
So they had wheels. In verse 21, when those went, uh, these went, and when those stood, these stood, and when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. Watch, look at this passage. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So these four living creatures literally had wheels. They had four, I say they had four of them, but they had, technically they had eight. Because that their wheel, each wheel had a wheel inside of it. And um, then you look, verse 25, there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads. So over the angels' heads, there was a platform. And then on that platform, above the firmament that was over their heads, was the likeness of a throne. On that platform was a throne. And then on that throne was someone sitting like the Son of Man. Okay? Here, here's, here's God now on His throne, on a platform that runs on four wheels. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, the chariots of God are 10,000, even thousands of angels. So literally, these angels were the chariot of God. They had wheels and they had a platform above their head that God sat on, on His throne. That was God's chariot. That's how God chose to move about. Does that make sense to everybody? I, I never thought about this. I always knew that these angels had wheels, but I'm going, okay, that's just weird. But it never occurred to me that the Bible specifically says that God rode in chariots that were angels, were made of angels. What are these people seeing? What have people seen throughout history? Chariots of flame, chariots of fire moving about the sky. Flaming chariots, vehicles up in the sky that move around in ways that we have nothing that moves around that way. Lights that shine and then they're, then they're gone. Boom, they're here and then they're gone. Okay? So, what are you getting at? Keep that in your mind. And let's go to Judges chapter 4. Uh, I answer questions, $5 for the first question, $8. No, I'm just kidding. Hmm. Oh, then you're out of order then. No, I'm just, I'm just playing with you. What do you need? I looked at barrel. <coughs> it comes in different colors like red and blue and green and stuff, but what I found interesting is the crystal system with the hexagonal structure. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Judges chapter 4, verse 2. Israel got dirty on God again. They turned, on, they turned against God, so the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor. Now, let me back up a little bit. Jabin, the king of Canaan, should be dead by now. Why? Because God told Joshua to go in and kill all the Canaanites and their king. And they didn't do it. And if you go back a little bit in the book of Judges, they are, God is just giving them what Israel didn't do during their war in Joshua's day. They were supposed to get rid of these guys and they didn't do it. And God said, I'm going to make them thorns in your eyes and Thorns in your flesh. They're going to be a snare and a trap to you. And sure enough, that's what's happening. So he sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera. Sisera dwelt in Heresheth of the Gentiles. Now look at verse 3. The children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. And 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Now, to me, it's interesting that this chariot deal, number one, is interesting to me. Number two, he said that he had chariots of iron. What am I thinking of, Ryan? Turn to Daniel, chapter 2. Daniel, chapter 2. I grew up... reading books on prophecy... Debbie Mayhew, your dad, 
I was visiting when he moved and him and your mom were running that bookstore down in Lebanon. We went visiting down there and I saw a book on prophecy and I picked it up and he saw me reading it. I was going to get it. I had some money in my pocket and he said, you reckon that guy knows what he's talking about? <laughs> Apparently, Warren Livingston didn't think he did. So I went, I don't know. And I got what he was saying. I put it back down and didn't buy it. So I think he probably saved me from believing something that wasn't right. Okay? Anyway, uh, where did I tell you? Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. I used to believe some things I don't believe anymore about the book of Daniel and about these kingdoms. The kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his vision, the first one was the, the, the head of gold, and the second one was the silver on his chest, and the third one was brass in his legs, and the fourth one, his feet were of iron, but the toes were different. They had iron mingled with miry clay. And so he's going to have to give Nebuchadnezzar, now he's told Nebuchadnezzar the dream that he dreamed, now he's going to tell him the interpretation of it. So he says in verse 39, this is the interpretation. Verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory, and so on. So Nebuchadnezzar was the, the gold head kingdom. And then he says, uh, after thee, verse 39, shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee. Because you think about it, the head, the head is of gold, but the chest is silver. Silver is less, worth less money than gold is. This whole thing depreciates in value over time. Sound familiar? Yeah. I got a bunch of that stuff, okay? But it goes from gold to silver to brass to just iron, and then it ends up iron mingled with dirt. Well, dirt's free, okay? Unless you're buying the good stuff. And then he said in verse 40, the fourth kingdom, and here's that number four. And I always think of principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high, and spiritual wickedness. He says spirits in high places. This is your fourth kingdom right here. It is a kingdom of spirits. God is going to allow very evil spirits to rule and reign over mankind. And God is going to allow these spirits to be very cruel and, and represent cruel authority. The beast that comes up out of the sea, he is a spirit king. He's real. Don't think spirit means they're not real. They're more real than we are. We're just the shadow of, of spiritual things, the Bible says. So they are more real than we are. They are going to rule over this. It, see, I always kept thinking about this idea that there was going to rise up this very popular, powerful man in Europe. And he was going to take... And I'm going, he's in Europe. What does that do to us? We're Americans. Right? Never made sense. There has been how many men who have tried to rule over the whole earth? And it never lasts. It doesn't work. You cannot have a man controlling every man, woman, and child on the planet. And I mean controlling them. So that they bow and voluntarily worship you. That doesn't exist. never has existed. This is going to be different. It's going to be a kingdom of spirits ruling over mankind. Okay? But, there's something unique about what they do. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all things, all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. If the iron represents these devils, what does the clay represent? Man. Man was made out of the dust of the earth. We are the clay. Thou, we always say that, God, you are the potter, we are the clay. God made us out of the dirt and out of the clay of the earth. 
So look at, and he's going to say that word for word. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Literally. Mingled into man's DNA. Literally. How that's going to happen, I don't know. When it gets here, I'll show you. Okay? When they actually do it, I'll say, see, that's how they did it. But how they do it right now, I do not know. But they are going to mingle themselves right into the very genetics of mankind. Your genetics determine who you are, what you are, and how you are. There's functions of your brain that come out in your actions and your character that are nothing more than the result of you getting it from your mom and dad. How many of y'all know that? Say amen. Say amen, Megan. Come on. Mom and dad's feelings are not hurt. They recognize it. They say, man, the worst in us came out in Megan. Because me and Lisa say it about ours. Our kids took our junk and made something of it. <laughs> Amen. But they're literally going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. These, I believe, this is what is represented by the 900 chariots of iron that Sisera came from. That, I, listen, if you were an army of Israel and that you had spears and swords and a guy comes at you with 900 tanks, and you have none, you might as well lay down and give up or fight to the death because you're going to lose no matter what. They're going to get you. And that's what Israel was looking at. I believe this world is going to have an invasion of aliens. Let me show you. Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verse 1, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. By the way, let me stop right here. Here you have two, the mentioning of two wonders in heaven. Remember what Peter said was going to happen on the day of the Lord? There should be wonders in heaven. And everybody's trying to make something out of the eclipse. Everybody's trying to, every time a star wiggles, somebody on YouTube says, That's the rapture! Here it comes! Get ready! And it never happens. You don't have to guess at what the wonders are. The Bible just told you. One, amen. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. One wonder is the woman clothed with the sun, and she's prevailing in birth. The other wonder is a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. What are these stars? Hot balls of gas? 13, 14 billion light years away? Yes, but they are also angels. There's no getting around it. That's what your Bible says. I believe it. I sure do. It, I mean, every place in the Bible where it talks about the host of heaven is stars, angels. They are the same thing. Okay? So anyway, uh, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. She brought forth the man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred three score days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Here's your invasion right here. This is the invasion of aliens. They are alien in every sense of the word. They are alien to... Our world, they are aliens in that God has given man dominion over this earth, not them. Amen? 
Does not the psalm say that God has made man a little lower than the angels, and yet he has crowned man with glory? And in the creation, when God made Adam, he gave Adam dominion over the earth. He gave man dominion over the earth, not the angels. They do not have dominion over this world. We do. When God has is had enough, God is going to give... Now, think, think about this. These... Spirits are beasts. And in the end times, God is going to take man who has dominion over beasts and flip it upside down, and now these beasts are going to have dominion over man. Man is going to be ruled by them instead of man ruling over them. So get ready for your puppy dog to attack you. And he's going to own you! Like... I think they made a movie about it. Planet of the Apes. Where the beasts take over and now they rule over man. And men are the slaves and not the beasts. So I know you think that's far-fetched. I'm just trying to make sense here of what the Bible's saying. These angels, a third of the angels of heaven are going to fall to the earth. What are they going to do down here? I think they're going to rule. I think they are that fourth kingdom... They are going to rule and they are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. And I can tell you, I can pull up websites and show you news articles and show you that right now mankind is trying to teach himself how to do just that. How to mingle inside the DNA of man various alien DNA types. And by that I mean they don't belong in man. And trying to mingle that into man's genetics to cure his diseases. We're learning how to do it right now. How long will it take before we finish it and figure out how to do it and we got it working? How long will it be? How many years? How many months? They could make a breakthrough. To, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at years down the road, but I don't think it's too many years. But they can make a breakthrough next month and advance that. By decades. We could see this come to pass. Who knows at what day we're going to see this come to pass. But here's, here's now, I, I set up the message, now I'm going to preach the message. I heard that. Sound like my mom. <clears throat> In Hebrews 11... What shall I more say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and of Jephthah and David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant and fight, and turned to flight the armies of the what? Aliens. Now let me just show you this one thing, okay? This one little piece here. Let me give this to you. Turn back to Judges chapter 4. Judges chapter 4. There's two, there's three characters, actually there's four here. There is uh, Barack, not Obama, okay? And then there is uh, Sisera, who is the guy that has the chariots of iron. He represents the Iron Kingdom. There is Deborah, who is the judge at this time. But really, uh, Barak is the one in charge of the armies, so she sent and called Barak the son of Abinoam out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with thee ten thousand men. Here's this number here. Ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun. And I will draw unto thee to the river of Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee. Do you know what I get out of this? I think Barak is the Lord Jesus Christ. Guess who Deborah is? The wife, the woman. We are the, she is the ten thousands of his saints. And she says, Barak, you go and destroy these. And he said, I'll go, but I want you to go with me. So Jesus is going to let us go with him. Amen! I'm, man, I, I think that's awesome, don't you? He, Jesus is saying, I'm not going unless you go with me. Thank you, John. 
Amen. She said, Surely I will go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now, in verse 14, uh, Barak, uh, yeah, And Deborah said unto Barak, Up for this is the day which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. That's the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. And in verse 18, that fought the battle, but Sisera fled like a little girl. All of his armies getting killed, and Sisera run off. And Jael went out, so he runs up upon the tent. He sees Jael, Heber's wife. And he goes up to her, and he's kind of been defeated in the battle. He's tired. He's thirsty. He's hungry. He's probably got wounds all over him. And Jael went out to meet Sisera, and she said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. <laughs> and he, when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. Here, lay down. Let me cover you up. Listen, I think she knew what she was going to do from the moment she saw him. Come on in here. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray, a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk, warm milk. What does warm milk do to you? She had him say, here, I take this warm milk. I got a, little, got a little hooch in here too. You want some of that? I mean, she doped him up. So anyway, she gave him to drink and covered him. And again, he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man here? Thou shalt say, No. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent, took a hammer in her hand, and went softly unto him, and smote the nail into his temples, and fastened it unto the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. See, the heading of that is, one of his heads was as it were wounded. Here is the enemy of God that receives a deadly wound in his head, and it was inflicted by who? The woman. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your... See, he's laying down on the ground. Bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Isn't that beautiful? Let's stand to our feet. That's good stuff, amen? That'll bless you. That'll make you happy. There's Samson killing a thousand men. Slew them. With the jawbone of an ass. I just think that's funny. Amen? How in the world could you kill people with a donkey's jaw? I don't know, but he figured out a way. He killed a thousand of them. Amen. The Lord bless you. Study Matthew this week. That's your homework assignment. Matthew talks a lot about the kingdom of God and how it pertains. All right? We'll get into that next Sunday night. Good to have you here. I hope I was a blessing to you tonight. I really do. Father in heaven, teach us great and mighty things that we know not. Open our eyes, dear God, and be, let us behold wondrous things out of thy law. Father, thank you, dear God, for letting us come and be in your house. Lord, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. So, Father, I'm thankful, dear God, you brought us all here. Pray, God, that you would dismiss us. Help us, dear God, to take the things that we have heard and go back to the Scriptures. Be Bereans and see whether these things be so or not. Father, just lift up our eyes and help us, dear God, to see the battle, Lord, that can be fought, the battle that can be won in our lives. Lord, if we'll just believe your word. Teach us some great things, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.